Okay, welcome to uh, the last in our series of uh, careers in science. My name is Robin McQueen. If you don't know me, I'm the uh, chair of physics here. And um, I'm welcoming today uh, Dr. Andre Marziali from uh, UBC. He um, has come to Langara several times in the past to speak about uh, the engineering physics program. Um, but today he's going to talk not only about engineering physics, he'll, he'll spend a bit of time talking about that program, but he'll also talk about uh, some of the, the work that he's done in, um, I guess, commercializing uh, some of the research that he's been involved in. Um, I have a few notes uh, about Dr. Marziali's background. Um, he actually went through EngPhys at UBC once upon a time, and then he went off to uh, Stanford to do his PhD and came back. He's now a um, professor at UBC and is director of the EngPhys program. So once a student, now director of the program. Um, and uh, he's won several awards for teaching excellence uh, and won an award for um, young, what, young Innovator Award from the BC Innovation Council. Um, and he has a number of patents. Uh, I don't think the number was up to date on, on your web page. Um, it was yeah, from 2006, so I'm guessing that it might not be up to date. Uh, and he's also, uh, one of the courses that he teaches is uh, always of interest to students when, uh, when they hear about it. Uh, it's a um, second year instrumentation course in which they do a, a robotics competition. And so you may have heard of that. Uh, he may say something about that as part of his talk. Um, we have had some of our excellent students from Langara go through engineering physics. And uh, so there is, there is the possibility that you could be there. Um, it's a very tough program. It has a reputation of being a tough program, but uh, some of our good students have gone through and graduated and, and been successful. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Marziali. Thank you. Well, thank you for, uh, for coming and listening to this. Um, as Robin mentioned, I am a graduate of the uh, engineering physics program at UBC, so I thought, given that this is careers in science, I thought I would try to spend you know, a fraction of an hour uh, telling you a little bit about my career because it ties in very closely to how I was trained in engineering and physics and then what I've done uh, since then. Um, as, as you heard, I spun off a company in the process. I was, I've been running a research lab uh, and I'll also, you know, try to give you a bit of flavor of, uh, of how I got there. Uh, let me start with the actual engineering physics program because uh, I don't know how many of you know about it, I, whether you've been told what's involved and so forth. I know there's, there's certainly um, information floating around. EngPhys is a mix of a full physics degree with an engineering degree. It's almost like doing a double major in engineering and physics. And the reason we do it is because by being trained deeply in physics and math, right? So, you know, the basic training of, of what really underlies uh, all of science, um, you get this incredible understanding of how things work at the fundamental scale. On its own, that's useful, but it becomes much, much more useful when you tack on an engineering degree to that, where you can take your fundamental understanding, ideas you may come up with uh, that come out of the physics, and have the skills to build circuits, build mechanical system, build automation and things like robot, do the engineering on top of that innovation to be able to translate it into real products and real services that are useful in society. Okay. So, I went through this program, I guess I graduated in 89. Um, you know, coming out of that program, you can do a lot of different things. I actually went to Stanford thinking I would do particle physics. And I did that for a while. Uh, realized in the end, I really liked to build stuff. Uh, so I transitioned into a uh, free electron laser group where I was building uh, particle accelerator systems for a free electron laser. Um, graduated from that and actually went to work in the Stanford biochemistry department. So. You know, in terms of the engineering physics program, it gives you a little bit of a hint as to how things go. And so many of my classmates and, and students that have come through the program since have had similar experiences. They'll go do software programming for a while, do mechanical engineering for a while, they'll go do you know, biophysics for a while. And you can really, you get such a, a broad uh, training in the program. And it is, you know, it's got a heavier course load. It's a little bit longer than the other programs. But as a result, you get such a broad training uh, that you can apply your skills in a wide variety of areas. So, uh, what I did is I went into the um, biochemistry department working with a guy named Ron Davis, uh, who's a famous geneticist, 
he was starting at the time, this is around 94 now, uh, he was starting to work on the Human Genome Project. Now, I'm assuming most of you have heard a little bit about that at least. Uh, it started in 1980, I think, through the Department of Energy, but it was what looked at the time to be a, this incredibly challenging project to decode all of our DNA. And by the time 94 had rolled around, sort of 14 years into the project, I think people had managed to do maybe 0.001% of the genome, right? The rest was still unknown. Uh, so Ron had this idea that what he really needed to do was to bring in physicists and bring in engineers and to develop machines that could sequence DNA faster. So I was uh, really one of the first people hired in his group as an engineer to work on that. So I spent the next four years building up a team of engineers uh, at Stanford uh, to build machines and automation uh, for the Human Genome Project, some of which uh, was commercialized. Uh, not by myself, but, but you know, by actually one of the graduate students in the program. Um, anyways, and then in 98, I came up to UBC, uh, just as the Genome Center here was starting uh, to pursue the same, same sort of work. So again, taking advantage of my physics training throughout, right? Because you know, all this work in genomics and in biology, in the end, had a lot of physics underneath it in the techniques that we used. Uh, and taking advantage of my engineering uh, to build robots, for example, for duplicating DNA, which is one of the things that I was doing at Stanford. So the lab I ended up starting uh, at UBC was really more uh, instrument development for DNA analysis. And out of that, uh, we ended up spinning off a company. So I'll mention the other hat I wear, which is president and CSO of uh, Boreal Genomics. And I, I, I am compelled at this point to point out I'm a shareholder. Um, so you can view the whole talk as an advertisement. I'm guessing you won't be buying any, uh, any of our instruments anytime soon. But um, I should put that out there. And um, so what, I do want to tell you a little bit of the story of how this company started, just to give you an example of um, not only what you can do with a career uh, in science, right, but how it can evolve into also a career in business, which is actually, roughly speaking, where I am now. So I will tell you a bit of a story how this started, because there's actually some takeaway messages in here. One is to pay careful attention to people, whether uh, at first you agree with what they're saying or not. Uh, I was already working in my lab uh, at UBC now uh, on DNA analysis, DNA purification, DNA amplification. But the idea for the company, in a sense, came from another uh, colleague of mine named Lauren Whitehead. Now, um, he's a very prolific entrepreneur at UBC. He started several companies. And at the time, he was working on uh, television display technologies. Now, you know, many of you probably own these now, or your parents may own them, uh, but these new LED backlit TVs, right, they have the really high dynamic range, and you've seen these in Future Shop. Anyways, uh, he invented that technology out of UBC, uh, spun it into a company called Brightside that got bought by Dolby, and Dolby presumably now licenses this into the, uh, to all the TV manufacturers. When I chatted with him in 2003, and this was in the coffee room in the physics department, he came up to me, he was starting to look at electrophoretic methods for making electronic paper. Okay, so this is now flexible paper that would change its content based on, on an electronic input. Imagine how useful that would be to have a notebook where you can store things and recall different pages but it looks and, and, and feels like paper. So he wanted to use uh, electric fields to move ink molecules around in paper. Right? Uh, that's a process called electrophoresis. And which I assume you're not familiar with. Um, you know, some molecules, it, it, when they're in liquid, are charged electrically. So if you run an electric current through a liquid, you can move molecules around. And uh, he wanted to do that with ink molecules. Now, coincidentally, I'd been doing it with DNA for quite some time, because DNA sequencing uses electrophoresis to move DNA around in a gel. So he came up to me and said, you know, look, I've had this idea. What do you think of this? If we could apply an alternating field, right? So look at the arrow on the screen something that goes back and forth like that. So you know about AC current, right, and DC current. We've got a bit of this good. Right? So if you imagine applying an AC current in a gel, charged molecules uh, in that gel or fluid or whatever it is would move back and forth. And you could do this over and over and over again, and the molecules would ultimately always return to their starting point. Okay? And then he said, what if we could do that, but then synchronously zap the molecules that were moving with something that changed their shape? so that on one half of the cycle, their shape was a little bit different than the other half. So maybe they'll move a little faster when they're being zapped, and a little slower when they're not being zapped. So we had ideas like, well, like, you know, we'll hit the molecules with a laser beam, they'll change shape, right? There's all sorts of molecules that do this. 
And then over time, if that happened, if every time the molecule was moving to your left, uh, we were zapping it with something that made its shape a little more aerodynamic, so to speak, uh, then it would sort of wiggle like this, and over time it would drift in one direction. Okay. And my response to that was roughly your response right now, which is, you know, so what? Um, but given that he was older than me and, uh, you know, much more distinguished, I, I sort of thought, okay, that's cool. I'll come back and we can chat in your office and, and work it out. And in fact, uh, it turned out to be quite an interesting idea. He wanted to measure the drag coefficient of molecules initially, as I understood it. Um, but, you know, so we thought, well, this might be an interesting way to move molecules around in a fluid. Let's just try it. And so what do two professors do when they've got a crazy idea to try and no funding to do it? Because, uh, you know, it was just a new idea. Um, we hired a student. So this guy, Joel Pell, uh, was a third year engineering physics undergraduate at the time. He was about to go on his co-op terms. You guys know about co-op and engineering? Most of the, at least those of you in the transfer program should. And uh, he was about to enter an eight month co-op term, which we have in Eng Phys uh, in third year. So um, he'd actually worked for me before as a second year co-op student. So I called him up and said, look, we've got this crazy idea. Can you come try it? I'll hire you for, for eight months and, and we can give it a shot. So he tried it. And uh, the way we initially tried it is there's this molecule called azobenzene, okay? And when you hit it with ultraviolet light, it, it, it like flips around and it changes shape. You hit it with white light and it turns back to its original shape. We thought, perfect, right? We've got a molecule that can change shape under light. So we'll put the alternating current in the fluid and then we'll zap ultraviolet light when it's moving to the right, white light when it's moving to the left, and the molecule should drift in one direction and we'll prove out that this concept works for whatever it might be useful for. Um, so he spent four months, his first four-month co-op term, trying this with, uh, with azobenzene and got absolutely nowhere. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think we understand that better now. Um, in part, just the amount of laser power required to convert enough molecules to make this uh, observable was, was too high, more than we had available. Uh, incredibly, he, he then stayed for the next four months, um, <laughs> despite that you know, uh, failure at that point. Um, but at that point, I thought, wait a second. I've been working with DNA for 10 years now. Um, I know that DNA under um, an electric field changes its shape. So maybe we could actually, using a laser, let's use crossed electric fields. And uh, we can make DNA change shape synchronously with some alternating current that we're applying. So he spent the next, uh, the next four months trying this. And the, the concept, and I hope you can uh, sort of make out this video that's playing uh, on the screen behind me. <coughs> These are single DNA molecules moving through a gel. It's not my video, it's from, it's from the internet, it's from University of Michigan. But look at these molecules and look how they stretch out and curl back up, right? DNA has this incredible negative charge on it. Like every nucleotide has a negative charge. So what's on the screen now is a virus DNA. Uh, that's about 48,000 nucleotides. So that's 48,000 negative charges. So you apply an electric field to this stuff and it moves, okay? Um, and if it runs into obstacles like a gel, so fibers of whatever, um, you know, they're strung together and try to prevent its motion in liquid. It'll squeeze through them, and sometimes it has to stretch out to do that. So here's a molecule now whose average shape you can change with electric field. It means that its velocity as a function of field is nonlinear. So we thought, wait a sec, we've got another way to do this now. What if we apply um, a zero time integrated field, so not exactly like an alternating current, but say you apply 300 volts per centimeter for one second to your left, and then 100 volts per centimeter for three seconds to your right. Molecules that don't change shape under field will come back to their starting point. They're going three times as fast in one direction for a third of the time, right? And then they'll, they'll come back and they'll be back to their uh, starting point. DNA, on the other hand, the more you crank up the field, the more it stretches out. So under the large electric field, up here, it actually moves more than three times faster than under the smaller electric field. So it has a net motion. At the end of every cycle, it has a net motion in one direction, which is what we were trying to achieve. But now, because it's DNA, we started to get some ideas of, hey, maybe we can do something cool in, in genomics um, with this. Now, you know, if you move DNA, what we really wanted to do in the end was to concentrate DNA, right? Move it into a smaller volume. That would be useful. If you use this method to do that somehow, you just squeeze molecules in this direction that squirt out in the other direction, so it wouldn't be that good. So we came up with actually um, this cool set of electric fields that 
really is everything I've explained, but in two dimensions now. So the orange field is like the alternating current, right? And the blue field just corrects the shape of the DNA and changes it synchronously um, with the driving field. And, and then they turn like this. Okay, so now it's in two dimensions. It's not just going back and forth. It's rotating, but one rotates twice as fast as the other. And I'm, I'm, I've skipped all the math and physics that go behind this, but I think even just looking at it, you can see there's some kind of circular symmetry here, right? So we figure that molecules, just general like, you know, chlorine ions, any, any other charged molecule that might be in the fluid would just go around in circles. But that DNA and RNA, any nucleic acids, would tend to spiral because the beginning and end point of the orbit would not be the same. There's always a point here where the fields line up and they're super strong, and then the, the other three quarters of the turn, they're sort of weaker. So it's, it's like the example I showed before, but in two dimensions. So we thought, great, we'll try this. So Joel worked on this uh, for another three and a half months uh, with absolutely no success, uh, getting actually towards the, the end of his eight month work term, it was getting near Christmas. Um, but at that point, you know, why did, why did we even pursue it for an additional three months? It had failed for four months with some molecule. We tried for another molecule for three months and still wasn't working. And um, I think this is ultimately why we study physics, okay? Because at this point, we knew it was going to work. And the reason we knew it was going to work, and I'm going to pull this up for you uh, if I can, is we did some numerical simulations. This is actually, this is the actual simulation I'm running on my laptop here. It doesn't take a lot of computing power. Uh, it's, it's written in a program called LabVIEW. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. If you've used Lego Mindstorms earlier in, in your career, uh, it's built off of a, roughly this programming language, a sim simplified version of it. Anyways, um, what I did here is I just coded the physical behavior of DNA in, in this program. Those little white dots you see are meant to be DNA molecules. Right? And then I applied the electric fields right, um, that we were wanting to apply to this system to see what would happen to them. Now, the physical behavior of DNA in a fluid is pretty well understood. It didn't take a lot of equations inside this program to write down the, the physics behind this process. Right? So if you understand electromagnetism, you understand a little bit of a polymer physics, you can write this simulation. And when you do the simulation, uh, this is roughly what happens. So the molecules move around in these kind of orbits, right? And they're kind of square here because I'm not making a smooth rotation. I'm kind of doing a stepwise rotation. So some subtleties that we you know, simplified so it would make it easier to, to compare to the experiment. But over time, you see they get closer to each other, right? So they're kind of moving around, but they're kind of spiraling towards the center. Now we've exaggerated uh, the orbit speed in the simulation. Sorry, we've exaggerated the orbit size, not the speed. So if we would have if we get rid of that, the, the orbit's really quite small, right? So you wouldn't normally see it. All that you'd see in the real experiment would be the net drift that's left after each orbit. And you see the molecules come together. So ultimately, the reason we study physics, right, is because with tools like this and the physics behind it, we can predict what's going to happen in experiments. It's pretty much the only uh, even slightly reliable way of predicting the future. Um, and sure enough, what we realized uh, along the way is that we had, we had some issues in the experiment. Oops, that's not it. And um, in fact, we were doing the right things. There was just, electric fields weren't great enough, the molecule we picked was kind of a bad example and so forth. And literally, and I mean days before Christmas, he finally got this. Now, what this is, you can just barely make it out. There's a square gel there full of DNA. Can you see a bit of a square glow? Okay. The DNA has been stained with a dye called cyber green. It makes it fluoresce under ultraviolet light. So this is a video that's been taken under ultraviolet light. Okay. You can see DNA throughout this gel. Around the side of the gel, we have electrodes that can apply the rotating fields I just showed you. And watch what happens now when we turn those fields on. In the room light here, I don't know if you caught it, but the actual pattern that that made coming to a focus point is exactly the same as the simulation, let alone the fact that it worked. Okay. So ultimately, the simulation predicted exactly what would happen in the experiment. 
And once we got you know the voltage stability and all that stuff correct, the little experimental details, then it finally worked. Great Christmas present for all of us, including Joel. Uh, in terms of careers in science, by the way, Joel graduated from engineering and physics, did his PhD with me on this topic, graduated about a year ago, and now uh, he's a founder, shareholder, uh, and runs the applications team at the company. If uh, the company does well, he's going to be very, very wealthy. So, <coughs> what we actually do with this machine, right, is we focus DNA, but because as I think I explained, the focusing relies on DNA's physical properties, right? That's kind of long and stretchy, it's heavily charged. Only the DNA focus. This turned out to be a really important um, advantage. So we can take something like this. This is uh, from the RCMP. It's a little uh, Q-tip that's been used to wipe up a bit of blood on soil, right? It's mocked up. It's not from an actual crime scene. This is, you know, they put some blood on the soil, mock, you know, wipe it up. And um, that sample would be full of, you know, it'd have a little bit of DNA from the blood. This was like a microliter of blood, so something about the tenth, a tenth the size of a raindrop, okay? Uh, so it'd have a little bit of DNA from blood, but tons of contaminants from soil. The stuff that makes soil brown, it's called humic acids or humic substances, they're a terrible inhibitor for DNA analysis. So samples like this normally foil the police, they just can't get the DNA off it, all right? Now, I'm sure you can think of a high profile case recently where all the samples were buried in soil. Um, so that's an issue. Turns out for the police, uh, blue jeans, uh, and actually a lot of other textiles uh, are problematic as well. If you get a blood spot on a pair of blue jeans, you cut out the blue jeans, you go to do a DNA extraction, the indigo dye, the blue dye that makes blue jeans blue, uh, it looks a lot like DNA and carries through the extraction and ends up fouling uh, the analysis at the end. Okay, so the forensics people were very interested in ways to get DNA away from contaminants that other people could not. And it turned out there's a whole host of other people that are interested in this as well, which I'll get to in a minute. But what we ended up doing is taking the technology I just showed you, this early development, and over several years now, developed it into an instrument where you could pay, put like a Q-tip and you know we dissolved it in detergent so all the blood cells would lice open and, and release their DNA. And then we would inject all the charged particles into a gel. We'd apply those rotating fields, which you can't see here, right? The DNA would focus. And then using another electric field, while we're holding the DNA trapped in the center of the gel, we could wash out the contaminants, like all this brown stuff from soil. So this is a time lapse of that uh, process where you can see uh, all the brown stuff getting in the gel in that first panel A. And then panel B and C, you can see the gel getting cleaner. And panel D, hopefully you can make it out. There's a little focus point of DNA in the middle. <coughs> so in the end, we ended up with a process that allowed us to get tiny amounts of DNA out of stuff. Um, and I, I won't go into all the reasons why that doesn't work with existing methodologies, but ours just, we've tested our method, we published it in PNAS, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, last year, that we could get 100 molecules of DNA out of five mils, five milliliters of fluid, which is like, you know, a, kind of a quarter glass or a tenth of a glass of, of you know, something like that. Okay, that's tiny. Very few other people can actually, I don't think any other technologies can do that. Um, and we could remove contaminants from DNA thousands of times better than other methods. So it's at that point, you know, that um, we started doing some demonstrations. We figured, okay, who's going, to, who's going to want this? Forensics we knew about. So we wrote a paper on forensics. The police sent us some 30 samples. We ran all of them. They managed to get DNA profiles out of all of them after running through our technology. Uh, and then we actually did what was probably one of our most compelling demonstrations is uh, the, the uh, Genome Sciences Center, the cancer agency, came to us <coughs> and said, we've got this project with Alberta, in fact, with Alberta oil companies. Um, they want to look in the Athabasca tar sands, right, where they get uh, petroleum from, and look to see what's been living down there, right? Um, of course, if anything was alive 60 meters down in the tar, it would have had to evolve there for the last 100 million years or so. Okay, it's not, it's not going to migrate from the surface. And if anything at all is left alive in the tar, uh, what's it been eating for the last 100 million years, if not tar and petroleum? All right, so imagine there's some, some, and here, I mean bacteria, not, you know, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so imagine, you know, the, the tar sands are really little grains of sand with a little bit of water layer around them and then embedded in petroleum. Okay. 
So you can imagine the possibility that some bacteria from the soil 100 million years ago got trapped down there and evolved to be able to digest petroleum as a food source. If that's true, these bacteria would, in, you know, they would encode the DNA for enzymes that could break down petroleum. So the bacteria themselves might be a good bacteria for bioremediation, but the enzymes they produce would also be good for both bioremediation and, and petroleum processing, right? So uh, very exciting. So they uh, started this project uh, with these oil companies. The oil companies dug up chunks of tar uh, from far down with sterile techniques and sterile tools so they wouldn't contaminate them with surface organisms. And then they tried to grow the organisms on a petri dish. Now, um, I didn't know this until recently, but it turns out if you take any handful of soil from outside and try to grow what's on it on a petri dish, you might manage to grow about 1% of the organisms in soil. The other 99% will not grow in the lab. I think the reason is they, they need specific conditions that need symbiosis between all the other organisms that are there, so they're very hard to isolate and grow. Anyways, they couldn't grow anything out of this stuff. It was, it was I mean, it's petroleum. It wasn't very good growth uh, media, apparently. Um, so they did what everyone does now in this field when you can't grow stuff, is you kill everything, and you get the DNA out and you sequence it. And then you can reconstruct it and figure out how many organisms were there and, and so forth. Um, figure out maybe what they did. Anyways, they tried that. They tried to get DNA out of these tar sands and they just couldn't do it. So they handed us the, uh, the tar once they uh, heard of our technology. And that was one of the first samples we ran through our early prototype instruments. And we ran that sample through. The DNA that came through was so clean and we got them so much DNA that they were able to go and sequence it and discover 200 new organisms. Okay. All of them significantly different from what you see on the surface soil. So that they were about 50% similar to what's on the surface, so indicating that they've been evolving away from, uh, from what we see now. So um, that's what we published in, in, in the paper last year, ultimately. So with several successes, we decided, well, you know, maybe this has some value. And uh, you know, I developed technologies before. I've got other patents, some of them from Stanford. And every time I'd done that, up till that point, I told the university, why don't you shop the patent around to someone, see if someone wants to license it. That way I get a check uh, without doing any work. Um, you know, someone else can take the technology and, and do something cool with it. Uh, this time, we looked at this and said, you know, this is really cool. And uh, I think we want to actually have our own company, not license this to somebody else. So myself, Joel, and four other members of my lab got together and founded uh, this company called uh, Boreal. So this is a bit of the timeline that led to that. Um, I don't know whether to go into a lot of detail here. Um, I think it's maybe important to flag how this, these things develop. I mean, when we had that first idea, we didn't have any money to pursue it. So I actually leached money away from another grant. I probably should be a bit of tape to say these things. But, um, you know, just a few thousand bucks to pay Joel to, to, to do his summer work on this. Uh, but then we applied to the National Institutes of Health uh, in, in the United States and asked them for, uh, I think it was around, I don't know, a million dollars, a million and a half, uh, to help us develop this tool to get DNA sequences out of soil for what's called metagenomics, exactly like the tar sands work. And they funded us, which was great. Uh, so they gave us some money. Now we actually had money to hire people. It grew the lab to probably a dozen people working on this and developed the technology further and further. Then we got another grant from NIH. Of course, this time I'm, I'm writing more and more grant application. I got another one from NIH. Uh, based on uh, cancer detection, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. So that gave us even more funding. We started, we filed more patents on this and sort of building up our intellectual property, getting some more money. We got some awards, as, as was mentioned. Uh, actually, that's not, this is a different one. Um, in 2007, we took this to a, uh, a conference and they gave us what's a relatively prestigious innovation award. Um, and, and this started to give us some, some visibility it also started to give us some, uh, some feeling that, um, that we were going to be uh, successful. One of the coolest things, and I, you know, if I was giving this talk to a bunch of other professors, they would probably be more impressed with this, but in our cancer application to the NIH, we got a score of 140, which is almost unheard of. Um, it was in the top one and a half percentile of all applications that the Cancer Institute of the States saw that year. Um, so with things like this, we said, all right, you know, we've, we've got something worthwhile. Let's, uh, let's start a company. Um, we had something else, though, which we knew, we knew that the stuff that we were developing was going to be useful. Okay? We can get DNA out of nearly anything. I mean, that's that's got to be useful. Okay? We didn't know what the market size might be for that.
But we also had, and this is back to physics predicting things, we had a computer simulation that I'd made up that made it look like if we made the right modifications uh, to the gel that we're running the DNA through, that not only could we get DNA out of stuff, but we could get specific genes. So you could encode a sequence, type in your favorite ACGGGCT, whatever DNA sequence, into the gel, and it, you know, explain how that's done. Um, but then only sequences matching that would extract. Imagine how useful that would be if you're looking in blood for a tumor marker, right? So you know there's some mutation in, you know, some lung cancer, for example, that flips an A to a C or something, right? And that's, you know, that's related to that cancer, right? So a tumor cell that develops with that cancer would have that mutation in it. Now, cancer cells die, unfortunately, not, not often enough. They grow faster than they die, but they do shed a lot of DNA into the bloodstream, right? That DNA is floating around for a while before it gets degraded. So if you had a really sensitive way to go into the bloodstream and pick out DNA molecules and analyze them, you could have a way to detect cancer early. The problem with that is you might have a couple of molecules from the tumor cell, particularly if the cancer is still small, but you're going to have trillions of molecules from your white blood cells. Right? So this is a huge problem, un still unsolved. Um, I mean, there's ways to get DNA out, it's just not, not very effective. And particularly if you're looking for a small mutation, it's going to be very hard to distinguish it from all the background DNA that's similar except for one letter. Okay. So if we could pick out very accurately certain sequences out of blood, we might have a way to enrich a sample for tumor markers, things that would help you diagnose cancer early. So we had this computer simulation, and uh, what I did in that simulation is I said, well, Okay, forget the stretching of DNA that's going on. That was really the driving force for the focusing that was happening, right? The fact that we change its shape under field. Forget that. Make the gel big enough, make the holes big enough in the gel so they can get through without changing shape a whole lot. But now um, attach DNA inside the gel. So we can write up a DNA sequence, 20, say, call it 20 nucleotides, right? Uh, in fact, what we did is we typed in T A C A T T T T, right? The complement to that sequence. He has no base pairing and all that. Okay. Um, sent that off to a company to synthesize it for us. They sent us back fragments of DNA synthesized with a little chemical group on the end that allowed us to attach them to the gel. So now we made a gel. If you can imagine at the molecular level inside, it's like it's hairy, right? It's got little fragments of DNA dangling around everywhere. Single strands of DNA. Now we take our sample that's DNA from blood, say, that's all sorts of stuff. We heat it up so all the, all the double helix, helices come apart. Now we've got single-stranded DNA again. We inject it into this gel and keep the gel warm. It's operating out 45, 50 degrees, right, near the temperature where these strands would fall apart anyways. And what's happening now is the DNA coming into the gel binds to the little bits inside if it matches the sequence, right? Uh, but then when the electric fields come around, and at the, sort of the peak of the electric field comes around, it rips your target DNA off the uh, little probes inside the gel and it moves again, then it binds again and gets ripped off and moves again. And that gave us this nonlinearity that I showed you at the beginning that was dependent on the sequence match. So the experiment we ran, you see behind you, we ran two molecules in a gel. They're 100 nucleotides long. The blue underlined sequence is what matches, what would match the... Uh, probe in the gel, right? So the gel probe, like I said, is T-A-C-A-T-T-T-T, G-C, and so forth. It's a complement to that sequence. Um, the one that matches it perfectly is labeled with a green fluorescent dye. The one that has a single letter change, that orange letter, is labeled in a red dye, right? And the simulation, right, told me that we would be able to split those into two different foci. We could focus on the two different locations because they have different amounts of focusing force. So that, go back to my story of starting the company, that, that's another reason why we started the company. We had this sort of upper sleeves. Um, we disclosed it to UBC, but no one really knew whether it would work or not, but we knew it would work. Uh, so we felt this had enormous value and we wanted to cash in on that ourselves. Um, and then, uh, you know, like, I guess a year later after we started the company, or a couple of years after we started the company, uh, we finally uh, got this. So this is going to play pretty quickly, but again, the green is the perfect match, the red is a single base mismatch. And you can see, depending on the temperature and field, we can focus just a perfect match. 
we can focus the mismatch as well, or we can separate them. And you're looking at two bits of DNA that vary by one letter. Okay? When we finally did the experiments to measure this more accurately, okay, we realized that we could remove, we could knock down the amount of mismatched DNA about 10,000 fold compared to the amount of perfect match DNA. The best competing method could, could separate them by about a factor of five instead of 10,000. So that's really, that's what uh, drove us to start the company. So we, we founded it in 2007. Uh, like I mixed up timelines, I'm jumping around a little bit here. Uh, we got that NIH grant. Again, the grants are to the university lab. So of course, when we started the company, we engaged in a relationship with UBC. That's, that's been fantastic, actually. UBC is great at starting companies. Uh, you won't hear that from everyone. There's a lot of people that complain about UBC in that respect. My experience with them has been phenomenal. They did everything they could to get us kicked off right. It took a year of haggling with them to get the license worked out, but it was actually you know, a good process and we got it figured out. So UBC owns some of our company, uh, not, not a ridiculous amount. And uh, we benefit by being able to license in anything that comes out of my lab at UBC. So we were able to continue to operate in my lab under government funding to do further technology development and pipe it into the company. Also, Right, like literally as soon as we uh, incorporated the company, the six of us got together over dinner and wine in um, uh, actually one of my grad students' basements and started building machines. Now we couldn't do commercial work at UBC and we didn't have office space or lab space that was not UBC space. So we used this basement and built these ugly white boxes that were really kind of prototypes of the technology. Cost us about 10,000 bucks each to build them. Um, basically we put all the parts on my credit card uh, hoping for the best, and uh, sold them each for 70,000 bucks. So, you know, we made a couple hundred thousand dollars right off the bat. People were dying to get this technology and they were willing to pay 70,000 bucks for a sheet metal box with some, you know, homemade electronics in it. Um, they're still working incredibly. Actually, uh, Joel uh, went to visit uh, one of these machines, well, and the people using it, um, that's at McGill. And uh, they, they love it. It's crap compared to what we're making now, but um, anyways. So, so we made some money there, and uh, at the same time, I thought, okay, what am I gonna do if I'm gonna start a company? Uh, I have no idea how to run a business. So it turns out uh, my roommate uh, at Stanford, Tom Willis, uh, he's one of the guys that I hired into that group to do the robotics development for the Human Genome Project. When I came up to UBC in 98, uh, shortly after, him and a few other guys from that group started a company called Paralleal Biosciences. And uh, they sold that, I guess, in early 2000, 2003, I can't remember exactly, uh, for about $140 million. Um, you know, of course, they'd taken some investment, so he didn't get $140 million himself, but he actually did uh, quite well, regardless. And um, also had been CEO, he'd, you know, grown a company that was 90 people when he sold it, so he'd had a lot of experience. So I went down to California and said, hey, you know, what's happening? Um, and discovered that he was about to leave his job with a company that bought his company, right? I mean, he invested all his shares, he was done, so he wanted to do something new. So I said, hey, we've got this cool technology, why don't you come help us out? And uh, he agreed to be a chairman of our board and to help us recruit people to the board of directors of the company. So we ended up with a board that had, I don't know, three of them, best known biotech tools people in California on it, right? Uh, Herb, Herb Heinecker um, was one of the uh, first, actually was the first employee in a company called Genentech, which became a giant. Um, anyway, so this, if nothing else, and he, and he put in, and Tom put in some of his money to help fund the company. So we raised a small amount of money, just a quarter of a million dollars. I put in some, he put in some, just to satisfy the UBC license, right? And then we started to apply for other grants. This time though, we were applying for grants to the company, not to my UBC lab. And in, yeah, August 2008, we got the first grant from the NIH that went directly to the company. Uh, at that, you know, until that moment, like I said, we didn't have an address. So I was using my mom's home address as the company address, uh, hoping no one would go visit. Um, and you wouldn't believe it, but the NIH actually started sending my mom checks for like 300,000 bucks every quarter. Not, obviously not addressed to her. Um, addressed to Boreal, but she was literally getting, getting these in her mail. Uh, so at that point we said, okay, we need space, we got money now, let's hire, you know, we can start paying ourselves. 
Um, so I think in around 2009, early 2009, we got a little bit of space in an incubator at UBC. And uh, I still wasn't getting paid by the company, but we, you know, we started paying a few people. And, uh, and then in early 2010, we got uh, the better part of the rest of that floor, you know, about 6,000 square feet. So, you know, and at that point, I probably shouldn't give out numbers, but nearly the whole company was still in our hands, I mean, meaning myself and the other founders. So this is not something that normally happens. Most companies that start, the inventors give away ownership of the bulk of the company right on day one to be able to raise money. So we did something that's called growing a company organically, right? Um, which we did it with a tiny amount of investment, largely internal, largely through grant funding and contracts and so forth. And I'll give you some more numbers on that later. But it got to a point where you know, we had 20 plus people, 6,000 square feet of space, ready to ship product and still hadn't uh, taken an investment that would dilute us, uh, our ownership. I do want to tell you a little bit more. I don't know if you guys saw this story in the sun last week. Um, I don't know why these things happen at such random times because this has existed for, for ages now. Um, but we have a method now, you know, along with all this DNA focusing stuff, we figured out a method to detect DNA. Because that focus spot, right? Now, you know, imagine, for, you know, forget the cancer analogy for a minute, but think a little bit about finding pathogens. So you want to look in blood for HIV, you want to look in blood or look in the throat swab for MRSA, uh, you know, the superbugs that are antibiotic resistant. Right. right now, again, the methods to analyze those are slow. They have to go to some centralized lab. You can't walk into a doctor's office and say, I'm sick, you know, what have I got? And expect an answer while you're there. There's no way. Right? They take a swab, they send it off for culture, and three days later, they phone you and tell you what you have. Well, if you, you, know, if you had MRSA, it would have been better to get the right antibiotics on day one, not three days later. Um, so I think there's a real need for these rapid detection methods. This, you know, the story that was in the sun was like the tricorder, right? I mean, we're, which, you know, we think we can make something very much like that, right? <coughs> I don't know if anybody here has ever watched Star Trek. Anyways, the, the point is, you know, make a handheld device. You can, you know, spit into a cup, pour it into a little cartridge, snap that into the device, and let the thing go for half an hour, and it'll say, yes, you've got, you know, avian flu, or you've got H1N1, or you've got the common cold, and you can go home and drink soup. Um, so the only thing that was missing for us to make a device like that was some way to just detect the DNA, right? So we can, you can imagine targeting, say, H1N1 DNA. We know it's sequence, right? And focusing that to the center, tagging it fluorescently, you'd have a little orbiting spot of fluorescent DNA only if that sequence was present in, in your saliva or something, right? So now you just have to detect very sensibly an orbiting uh, fo uh, focus spot. Well, it turns out that we have this unique ability to keep the DNA focused as, it's, as it orbits. No one else can do that. It comes out of our, you know, this whole focusing process. Um, which means that we can use these techniques that are used to pick up signals from deep space probes. So this is again where, you know, if you understand a bit of the physics and a bit of the engineering, a bit of the biology, you can tie all this stuff together, right? If you're picking up a signal from a probe that's out past Jupiter, the way that's done is on Earth, you already know because you designed the probe, you know what frequency it's sending you data at. <coughs> so you, you know the frequency of the radio signal that's coming from that probe. So you make that exact frequency on Earth and you multiply that frequency against all the incoming radio signals, right? And if you integrate long enough, it picks out that one frequency from the rest of the background, right? And allows you to detect incredibly weak signals uh, from a distance. So we just applied that same technique here, right? We've got a focused spot, right? We know the frequency at which it's rotating in the gel. So we can take a video, instead of just taking a picture and trying to, trying to detect the fluorescence, we take a video and multiply the video frames times the sine wave that's effectively at that frequency. So the first image, when you just take a picture, looks like that, okay? But after only 15 orbits, there's the DNA starting to come out. So that's really an algorithm that's pulling out only, only rotating pixels out of the noise. It's very much, if you look at a uh, night sky full of stars and you're asked to, you know, say, hey, we need to find, you know, one star that looks like this, right? You, you, there's no way you'd ever find it. But you've seen shooting stars, right? As soon as something's moving, you can, you can pick it out away from the background of the star sky, right? That's kind of what we're doing. In a more dramatic demonstration, we started with 100 picograms of DNA. This is like, well, maybe 20 human cells equivalent. In a picture, you can see how it's like TV, you know, this sort of background noise, right? You can't, just, there's no way you can see it. 
after 100 rotations, actually 50 rotations, 100 images, you can see the uh, in and out of phase ends of the orbit coming out of the noise. So we think we can couple this detection method to uh, all the enrichment stuff we've done to really build a very, very simple device. So, you know, our applications, um, we've got several levels to our technology that have gone through. The DNA cleanup is mostly going to be used in forensics, potentially in biodefense. Um, I should say I've skipped parts of the story again, but um, we've gotten a lot of money from the U.S. government, not just the Institutes of Health, but Homeland Security, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, um, and now a group called InQtel that I'll leave you to look up because uh, I can't speak to who they are, um, but you can imagine. And um, so these people have funded us now to around $10 million. Uh, and they're not, uh, with the exception of InQtel, who took a small fraction of our company, um, the rest have basically just given us this money to do the research and development. So we've been able to leverage that money to try to build techniques that are going to be useful uh, in medicine, right? Uh, at the same time as they're useful to, to buy defense. Obviously, what these people are interested in is finding uh, potential biowarfare agents early on. So they have all sorts of programs where, you know, they want to put instruments on street corners and monitor air in case there's a terrorist attack where people release some really nasty bug into the environment. So that's cleaning up the DNA away from contaminants like uh, diesel soot in a subway system. You can imagine it would be very interesting, right? Depending where you place these monitors. Uh, then, of course, the, the applications uh, in the enriched side are, are things like early cancer detection, uh, pathogen detection. Again, there's forensics applications here, uh, all sorts of research applications. Okay, so we're going after all those. And then finally, if we can make this point of care, this handheld unit, there'd be applications both in biodefense, uh, things like food safety, right, um, and, and, and clinical diagnostics. So we shipped our first uh, beta unit of the DNA purification system. This is not the handheld tricorder, despite what, the way that story first read when it hit Google News last Friday. We haven't made the tricorder yet. Uh, they lied about that. Uh, we got them to change it before it went to print. But um, with funding, we should be able to put that together in I think the next uh, three years or so. But we are shipping now machines. We shipped the first beta unit of the Aurora, which is a DNA purification instrument based on the technology I just showed you. And, um, you know, this is roughly where we've ended up. We're about 28 people now. Um, we have all sorts of partnerships going on, uh, government-funded programs. I said we're funded by, you know, DITRA, um, where's Homeland Security? What's going on here? Anyways, we're funded by uh, DHS and, uh, and all sorts of other people. And uh, we managed to get to the point where we finally did take a venture financing, right? So we sold part of our company to investors. Uh, because we finally needed to build, you know, sales and marketing force. We needed, um, you know, to build on the business side of the company. At this point, 28 people, but there's like three people that are administrators, if you count half of me, right? Um, all the rest were scientists and engineers, so not the right mix to really take things to market. At that point, you need business people. So, uh, but we managed to raise this money at a time when we had already brought in, you know, $10 million in grants and contracts and so forth. So we, we managed to um, get what's called a good valuation for the company, where it was highly valued. We didn't sell that much of our company to get $6 million. And that's, that's roughly where we've ended up. So that's a long and convoluted story of one career. Um, and it's still in progress. I, um, you know, I'm splitting my time right now between the company and UBC. I reduced my faculty appointment at UBC so I can spend time in the company. I'm still doing both, uh, which is actually a great mix because I can take experience from the company and bring it to my students in engineering and physics. So one of the things we've tried to do more and more of in engineering and physics is promote entrepreneurship, starting companies. We have a number of our students that in their final year at UBC as undergrads actually spin off companies. Uh, Clinic Book is one that's, that's very recent. It's spun off by one of our students. Um, anyway, so I, I guess, you know, Getting back to the program uh, that could train you to work in these areas, as I hope you've gotten a sense from this, you know, the, the biggest strength of the program, and all six founders, by the way, were engineering physics people. And the reason for that is, is that I needed, you know, we were gonna build instruments in our basements. I didn't want someone who understood electrical engineering, I want someone who understood electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, physics, you know, and, and other things, right? Because we had to do a bit of everything. We couldn't just, we didn't have enough people to, to partition ourselves into different areas. So 
that's basically what we do in Fizz. You know, in the in the second year, you're taking electrical courses, you're taking mechanical courses, you're taking physics, you're taking math, you're taking you know um, sometimes courses on um, economy of engineering and things like that. Um, and then of course you can you can specialize in a whole bunch of areas by taking electives, which are kind of free to choose now. Uh, so a lot of the people that ended up working with me took uh, courses like biology 437 as an elective without having any biology. We have some nice deals with some of the profs at UBC though let us skip prereqs just based on the quality of our students. And Biology 437 is one of those where you can walk in and, and sequence DNA. It's entirely lab based. It's not a lecture course, right? But you get to run DNA sequencers and protein analysis and synthesize DNA and all this stuff. Um, and that's, that's in my field, obviously, but there's, there's opportunities like that in astronomy and in uh, you know, environmental science and so forth. Um, so I will uh, just finish with a few words on sort of what, what you do. I mean, you can obviously you know, I, I gave you one example of a career in engineering. Not everyone uh, goes through that same path. Um, a lot of our students go to graduate school, right? And some go to work in engineering companies. They tend to work more research-oriented jobs because of this sort of background. Of course, then we have students that go to med school, law school. Some go off to Wall Street and, and a whole host of other things. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. Uh, to some companies that hire students. Grad schools love us. Uh, last year, I think we had three admissions into Stanford, and the incoming pool at Stanford is maybe 30 students. So every school on the planet is trying to get their students admitted there, so I think we have a pretty good track record from a single program. Um, and they know us. I mean, if you go to Caltech, if you go to Oxford, if you go to Princeton, you know, any of these schools, I mentioned UBC Engineering and Physics, they know who we are. It's just, you know, the trade-off for having a difficult program is, um, you know, you get something when you graduate. So, and we're building an electric race car. So it's a random off topic. But, um, so one of the things we do in engineering is we have uh, extracurricular teams where you can get design experience that you wouldn't get in the classroom necessarily. We've, had, we've competed in the NASA Space Elevator Challenge. Uh, we compete in the Lunar Excavator Challenge. We've got three teams running now. One is a satellite design team. One is a rapid prototyping team. And the third is this electric racing team. Um, spurred a little bit by my hobby, and then uh, one of my classmates from 89 actually donated a whole lot of electric vehicle equi equipment to, to Engfiz, so we were trying to decide what to do with it. We bought a Formula Reynard, in fact, that exact Formula Reynard um, open wheel race car, and are now converting it to electric to compete, not in engineering competitions, but the idea for this team is to compete in racing locally. There's a great scene here, uh, I don't know if you guys know, uh, local club racing, and uh, we're hoping to beat the gasoline power cars, <laughs> except for mine. Um, so that should be fun. I mean, the students through the university club, we can actually even train the students as drivers. Um, so that, that should be an exciting thing. But it gives you a sense of some of the things that you can do sort of outside the classroom uh, in Engfiz. So if you want more information on engineering physics or anything for that matter, feel free to email me. Um, we do have open houses and things where you can come out. I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities. I do want to say the program does have a reputation for being difficult. Um, if you don't like math and physics, I can guarantee you it will be difficult. If you like math and physics, it's actually not that hard. Right, we've, uh, since I took the program, we've shaved probably, I don't know, 20 credits out of it. So it's, it's lower workload now than it used to be. I just cut out three more again in the curriculum change this year um, to try to bring the course load down to something that matches the other engineering programs so it's not a super heavy course load. We do have an extra academic term and one less co-op term. And what that does is lets us take more courses without having a higher course load necessary and without going longer. So whether you, uh, you know, go mechanical, electrical, or engine phys, it's five years if you're with co-op. So we, you don't have to take extra time there. So if you're unsure, feel free to email me and maybe I can set up a tour or something. But um, with that, I hope that was useful. Thank you. So, do you have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, I've got all sorts of time. Um, I understand that um, students can go into biomedical engineering from either mechanical or electrical engineering. Is it yeah. also possible to go into biomedical engineering through engineering physics? Uh, there's no biomedical engineering undergraduate option in engineering physics. Uh, you can go into their biomedical graduate program from engineering physics. So we only have, um, and I've breezed through a bit of that, I apologize, but we have three options in engineering physics, electrical, mechanical, and mechatronic science. Mechatronic science is um, like a, a micro scale mixing of electrical and mechanical engineering. Um, we do have electives you can take that 
would speak to biomedical engineering, including courses like biophysics and, and, and so forth. And in fact, I think you might even be able to get into some of the courses in those options, though it depends on, on the, uh, those departments letting you in. Um, you know, we haven't, over the years, we went from having, I think, five or six different options in, in EngPhys, actually maybe it was eight back in the day, and we whittled it down to really two main options, with mechatronic science being a small third option. And I was partly the, the person that drove that, myself and the previous director, Jeff Young. And the, the reason was we felt, let's make like two super strong options and let the students take electives of their choosing above that. So we won't funnel you into, okay, you're taking all Earth and Ocean Sciences courses. You can take an Earth and Ocean Science elective, you can take a Biophysics elective if you want. So you can mix things now, because you're never gonna get super deep training in Biomed Engineering, no matter what option you go through. But if you can get a few courses out of different things like that, you'll at least get an early flavor for what you want to do. And then you'll get further training later, whether at work or whether you go to graduate school. So I think that, that's the sort of approach we've taken. How is the uh, mechanical discipline of engineering physics different from the old mechanical engineering program that mm -hmm. UBC offers? First part, that, and second, if you get into the mechanical discipline of engineering physics, uh, could you, would it be useful for uh, aerospace engineering as your graduate studies, or is it better not to you know, mix it up that much? Yeah, great question. So the first one, uh, what I actually urge all of you to do is go to the UBC calendar and look at the courses you take in engineering physics and then compare to a mechanical or something, right? You gotta be careful cross-referencing them because sometimes we study the same material under different course numbers. So we might have a course labeled Phys 401 that could be ENM and electrical will have a course, electrical something or rather that's the same material. Once you do that, you see that if you come into an engineering physics, say go mechanical option, you're gonna take, I don't know, 70% of 80% of the mechanical engineering that they would take, but then get all the physics and math on top of it. So keep in mind, at the undergrad level, you're still getting the basics. You're getting, everyone has to get math, everyone has to get physics, you've gotta get basic material science, right? There's a lot of courses that are gonna be shared across all these disciplines. The number of courses that are specialized on top of that are actually relatively few, right? So guaranteed, if you're gonna be a mechanical engineer, you want to do strictly mechanical engineering, right? Go to mechanical engineering. Um, if you want to do something kind of beyond that, where you're going to take your mechanical engineering, mix it with some more advanced stuff that might require physics, that engineering would be a good place to go. So you, you talk about aerospace. Now I'm not in that field, okay? Um, but I know, for example, that actually talking to the head of mechanical engineering recently, they have things like computational fluid dynamics in uh, in mech, uh, finite element analysis. These are all the numerical things that you'll need to compute flow velocities over a wing or a rocket or whatever it is, okay? Um, those are kind of electives there. We've taken that and we've made that part of our core, right? So we've just rebuilt our senior math courses to include more numerical methods for solving differential equations. We've added a physics course called Physics 410 uh, Computational Physics, right? And we're about to rebuild one of our second year labs to be a finite element analysis lab. And then you can still take CFD with Mac, right? As an elective out of our program. So if you want to prepare yourself for aerospace, you should be take as much numerical analysis as you can, because ultimately you're gonna be working on giant supercomputers that are modeling, uh, you know, flows, right? So, you know, I, I've got this very biased view. It's partly from being, having been through the program and also hiring people out of the program, and I've hired people out of the other engineering disciplines. But if you're gonna push the boundaries of science or engineering, you've gotta understand the underlying physics. I just, I don't believe the other programs get enough of that, right? Which, you know, it means that if you go to one of those programs, it shouldn't, say negative things on uh, well, being taped here, but <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're gonna end up in a, you know, in a mechanical engineering job, right? Um, so if you look in my company, I've got an electrical engineer who went through electrical. He designs our circuit boards. That's, that's all he does. Because I can't move him into working out you know, some crazy new electric field setup that we have you know, at, at the front end of our system. Whereas the Engvis people in my company are jumping around from research project to research project, always being put on the hardest things that we run into. That's, that's my experience with that. Yeah. How many extra credits is, uh, does, does engineering physics require compared to other engineering programs? Good question. I, I don't remember what the other ones require. Uh, we require something like 175 credits. 
30 more credits? 30, 35. Might be. The other one are around one Okay. Yeah, it that might be right. The whole extra term would be about 20 extra credits and then maybe a few more here and there. We probably should. Oh, one more. Maybe. How, how does it account for, uh, like, for example, viruses? Because my understanding, my limited understanding of biology is that they mutate uh, a lot. And oh, yeah, it's a huge issue. So how do, how do you compensate for that? I was just talking to someone on the phone about that, because um, our defense threat reduction people are also concerned that someone's going to engineer a different sequence and get around the detection. Um, there are sequences that are highly conserved in a whole lot of these organisms. So they do mutate, uh, but some things remain conserved. And it becomes a bioinformatics challenge to identify the right sequences to target so that you know that you might have a type of virus. Maybe you know, you, it will have mutated and you can't tell or, you know. Um, but this, you know, this H1N1 outbreak, when that was detected, it was on a machine, uh, actually people we collaborated with, that were recognizing conserved sequences in different flu types. So normally you might light up, you know, human flu or something, right? I mean, I, and I'm not a biologist, so I don't know all the exact details, but I know that they, their machine lit up on like some avian um, segment of sequence, a human segment of sequence, and a swine sequence. And they were like, "Well, we've never seen anything like that before." So they sent it for um, to the Center for Disease Control, and, and, and that got fully sequenced, and then they figured out what it was. But they did, despite the fact that they didn't, it had mutated and they didn't know the sequence ahead of time, they found conserved sequences in it that they could identify and flag it. But that's, you know, that's, that is a huge challenge that will be with the bioinformaticians that uh, we're collaborating with uh, to identify the correct sequences to look for so you don't run the risk of mutation. Um, actually, I've got a question about, uh, in terms of like the people that are in your company, it sounds like you have a lot of people who are working yeah. Um, do you, you said you're collaborating with a whole bunch of other people. So, in your company, have you hired? Um, at a, you know UBC Biology, the UBC BCIT Biotech program is phenomenal. We've got some people from that. We've got people out of biochemistry. Um, people we pulled in out of the states. So, yeah, we, we're not strictly in Schweiz. It should be you know about half our company is actually in Schweiz. But then then we had spread out into you know I've hired software people as well, right? Some yeah. computer science. But in that case too, and just to, you know, if you're gonna go into these, the first software guy we hired did a dual computer science biology degree. The next guy I'm bringing in and recruiting back from, from the Netherlands did two undergrad degrees, one in mechanical engineering, one in biochemistry. So these guys are incredibly useful, right? Because they can span fields, even if it's not in Schwiz, to have a multidisciplinary training, it's phenomenal. Um, do we have, let's say the last question, okay, sorry. Uh, I know that UBC doesn't exactly facilitate switching in between engineering disciplines. So if you're not exactly sure, is engineering physics something you would or would not recommend we put down? Huh. Um, so, you know, we have people that switch all the time, in and out of EngPhys. Uh, because we do get people that come into EngPhys that take the second year program and they go, oh great, you know, I like all my mechanical engineering courses, but I can't stand this physics and, and the move is obvious to go to mechanical. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's a problem from the university standpoint to have students switch. I would think we don't do anything to inhibit it, but it tends to set you back. So you will spend more time in your degree because if you do second year with EngPhys and then transfer to mechanical, you'll be missing a whole bunch of courses that they did in their second year integrated program or something. Um, if you're not sure, I, you know, I, I would say, first of all, talk to a few people. Right? You come talk to me, talk to someone mechanical, try to get a sense of what's in all these programs and what might be right for you. And definitely go through the calendar and look at all the courses, look up all the numbers, read the descriptions, and see which ones you see yourself enjoying more. Uh, you know, the advice I always give students is don't, you know, I, I know people tell you you should go into one thing or the other, maybe your parents are steering you one way or the other. Find the program that you will enjoy the most and go after that because from any of these programs you can have a phenomenal career. But if you go into a program that you don't like, for whatever reason, and you end up with a low average at the end, then you're kind of burning your, your options for a career, right? You're gonna do much better in mechanical engineering with an 80% average than you'll do in EngPhys with a 60% average. So you've gotta keep, make, make sure you enjoy what you're gonna do, right? I think that's, that's the, uh, the key thing. And then if you make the wrong choice, yeah, you can switch. It sets you back a bit. It's not the end of the world. Okay, thanks very much. I
I, I'm really impressed by uh, how you've shown us the um, nature of interdisciplinary work and how useful it is to know lots about lots of different things and bring in, say, astronomy techniques into biology, the ability to do that. It's, uh, it's quite amazing, quite inspiring. Um, and I want to say um, we're very lucky to have Dr. Marziali here today. He just came back from a conference yesterday. The day before, yeah. Before, yeah. And he's leaving tomorrow. So he's like, this is a brief window of opportunity. So we're very lucky. That's my life again. Yeah.